toxicology and heavy metals in the environment. Time and again I have been talking about toxicology, I have been talking about environment and the pollution that the metals have caused. In the previous lecture we had seen which are the nine notorious heavy metals and today we will proceed with some more of the information that is re related to heavy metal contamination. Environmental toxicology, it is a very important topic which an analyst must know and understand in order to be able to be an efficient analyzer for metal determination. Two important sources of pollutants affecting the environment are discharge of industrial pollutants and automobiles. These are two major issues from where the pollution actually comes in. One is that the industrial effluent sometimes is just left untreated and it is run into the soil or into the, into the water body and the other one is from the automobile. Liver and lung diseases resulting from vehicular pollution affect people living in the urban areas. Modern agricultural practices lead to the saturation of soil and water with very dangerous chemicals such as pesticides and fertilizers. What are the environmental toxins? Heavy metals, pesticides, chlorinated hydrocarbon or PCBs which I have already covered, polychlorinated biphenyls, polyaromatic cyclic hydrocarbons, plastics, many industrial chemicals which lead to the environmental degradation. So you see these are the broad scale of environmental pollutants and I, there would be many more but I have just listed a broad list of heavy metals, pesticide, chlorinated hydrocarbons, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, plastics and many other industrial chemicals. What does environmental degradation lead to? Now let us understand this whole process. Health conditions of individual is affected. Genetic and harmonic, hormonal changes caused by the toxins take place. Harmful effects of toxin on immune system and nervous system takes place. Cardiac, respiratory and other disorder cause of indoor and outdoor pollution are the main reasons that cause environmental degradation. Metals as pollutants, even in the previous lecture we had seen that the nine notorious heavy metals were the main toxins or the main pollutants, but there are other metals also and any metal which is present in larger quantity can exceed the limit and be in the category of a toxin. Heavy metals such as iron, manganese, zinc, chromium, copper, nickel, arsenic, lead, mercury and cadmium are the nine ones of which the last three have no biological significance or beneficial use and are extremely toxic. So among the extremely toxic metals are lead, mercury and cadmium. Metals are not biodegradable. Air, soil and water have varying amounts of toxic heavy metals. So you see that they do not biodegrade in the system whether it is environmental system or biological system and they are present in air, soil and water. Most susceptible are regions where inorganic chemical industries using metals are concentrated and the most dangerous area where one would find metal uh, toxicity are the areas where there are industries which are related to inorganic compounds. Contributors to metal po uh, pollution, now which are the industries that are related to or are the cause for creating metal pollution, tanneries, mining belts and metal smelters, textile and dyeing houses, steel cities, collieries, 
sites of coal based thermal power houses, Ganga Delta acts as a sink for a variety of metals received through sewage, industrial effluent and accidental spills. So, I gave you a list of huge list of industries, because in industries at some step of the processing, some metal is being used. And unfortunately, in our country, the rules have not been laid down by the government in a very stringent manner. As a result, not every industry is treating their effluent. And the untreated effluent, when it is run into the Ganges or any other nearby river, it actually causes a lot of pollution in the water that is being flowing in that river. And what even the sewage water, the industrial effluent and sometimes the accident spill add on to the pollution problem. Indestructible poison, even a small concentration is capable of disrupting the body's normal metabolic function. Now, what happens when the metal enters our body or any other pollutant for that matter, it could be PCB or it could be pesticide or it could be polyaromatic hydrocarbon. When they enter the biological system, they do not find a way to get out of the biological system. As a result, they keep on bioaccumulating in the system and as a result, it becomes as a toxin in a particular organ. Heavy metals are in the air we breathe, the food we eat and the water we drink. So, can we avoid heavy metals? We really cannot avoid because we need to breathe, we need to eat and we need to drink water. Heavy metal pollution can remain dormant for a very long time and then surface with full force. What happens when small amount, trace amount of toxin gets into our body, it does not show any adverse effect or any disease that appears to be appearing. But over a period of time, due to bioaccumulation, this gets accumulated and reaches a threshold limit where it starts interfering with the metabolic activity of the cell. And that is where it starts creating or becomes a cause of a disease. Analysis of heavy metal thus becomes very imperative, because in order to know whether it has reached the threshold level, what is the kind of levels of each of these heavy metals in the environmental sample, it is important to have a very distinct protocol of testing. Analysis of heavy metals and trace metals can be done very efficiently by means of a very efficient and foolproof method, which is called atomic absorption spectrometer or AAS. And a very similar kind of uh, another instrument, which is called inductively coupled plasma spectrometer ICP. Sample preparation is an important part of the analysis. Time and again, I have been emphasizing on the fact that sample preparation is very important and very crucial. Acid digestion by oxidizing acids is the routine procedure. However, stubborn samples are digested, digested in specialized microwave digesters with combination of acids or by first ashing and then acid digestion. So, we had seen in the previous lectures how these focused microwave digesters are required to sometimes uh, digest the stubborn samples of the metals uh, that need to be acid digested. Sometimes a programmed pro, uh, procedure has to be applied where a variety of acids are added one by one in order to completely digest the sample. Atomic absorption. In atomic absorption, the flame functions to convert the sample aerosol into atomic vapor, which can then absorb light from the primary light source, which is a hollow cathode lamp HDL or electrode less discharge lamp EDL. In this what happens, sample is first dissolved, the metal 
is first converted into metal ion and this is now in the solution form. The solution is then converted into an aerosol. You must have seen these spraying machines. They convert the liquid into an aerosol. So, similar type of aerosol is produced through a nozzle and then this aerosol is then passed through a flame. In the flame, it takes that acts as a primary source of energy and that is then converted into the metal zero state. From the ionic state, it becomes metal vapor. Air acetylene flame is preferred flame for the determination of approximately 35 elements. The temperature of air acetylene flame is about 2300 degrees centigrade. So, you see that at that temperature, the air acetylene flame provides the energy for the conversion of the metal ion to the metal zero state. Other flame mode, the nitrous oxide acetylene flame has a maximum temperature of about 2900 degrees and is mainly used for the elements which form refractory oxides. Now, normally air acetylene would be applied as a flame, but in case of certain elements where they have a tendency to form oxides in the flame, there is this nitrous oxide acetylene flame which has a furthermore higher temperature as compared to the air acetylene flame and that is particularly used for aluminum. It is also used to overcome chemical interferences that may be present in flames at low temperature. So, sometimes when there are chemical interferences, even that helps because nitrous oxide acetylene flame is always at a higher temperature and this prevents all the in interferences to be withered off. Choice of nitrous oxide flame is mainly for elements as I mentioned a little while ago for aluminum, boron, barium, molybdenum, strontium, silicon and titanium. Comparison of analytical techniques, if we try to see that how does an AAS vis-a-vis an ICP work, there must be some advantage in each one of them and there must be some disadvantage in each one of them. It is always a, a very scientific proof that no single method is the ultimate method. There has to be an edge over when there are scientific advancements, it comes from the necessity point of view. Now, if we try to look at the working of the ICP, in ICP instead of an air acetylene flame, there is a plasma flame which is created by argon gas. So, the argon gas which is used is very, very costly. And so, the speed at which the analysis can be compared in AAS analysis can be done only one by one, one element at a time. Whereas, in ICP multi elements are analyzed, even the sensitivity is moderate in terms of AAS, but in the case of ICP it is highly sensitive and thus it is good. Interferences, very few interferences are uh, experienced while working with AAS. However, there are spectral interferences when we are doing multi element analysis in ICP. When it comes to cost, relative cost is moderate in the case of AAS, but in ICP the cost of analysis is very high. So, one has to make a choice for as an analyzer, one has to choose which one is more sensitive, where is it required, at that point of time the cost effectivity is not taken into account. But when one has to do a large number of sample, I think the answer is AAS. If one looks at a pictorial diagram of an AAS machine, 
this is a hollow cathode lamp and that provides the energy and there is a flame, there are lenses to focus the energy and it goes through the monochromator and then to the detector and then from the detector it goes to the amplifier and then the results are read out. This is like a pictorial diagram of how the source of light and the lenses and the flame are in conjunction in an AAS machine. Standard preparation. Now, since both ICP and AAS are calibration methods, one needs to have a standard as a reference and against that standard, how these samples will fare, whether it will be, be above the, that grade or will, whether it will be below that grade. So, we need to have a scale. A standard is like a scale and against which it is measured. Standard solutions to be prepared from stock solution purchased from certified stock standards meant for calibration. There are companies who supply standard stock solution and they are used for calibration purposes. For example, if I have to analyze copper or chromium, I will buy from the company a stock solution of 1000 ppm of copper and chromium separately and use it by diluting it at the time of analysis. Alternatively, stock standards can be prepared directly from the reagent grade chemicals. However, it is not always necessary that one needs to buy the chemical all the time. One can even prepare the stock solution. Presence of dilute acid that is 0.1 percent to 1 percent in many solution lengthens the life of standard. The standards must be preserved with a little amount of acid so that they are stabilized. Limitation of flame atomic absorption sensitivity. As I said, every process has its advantages as well as disadvantages. Here we will discuss the limitations of flame AAS. Although flame AA is very rapid and precise method of analysis, where determinations of analyte concentrations in milligram per liter is done routinely, which means it is ppm level. However, the need for trace metal analysis at microgram per liter and even sometimes sub microgram per liter calls for a more sensitive technique. Now, as I said, when analysis has to be done at ppb or ppt level, AAS is not the solution. Why? Because the sensitivity is only up to the ppm level and it cannot analyze trace elements. This limitation can be improved by improving sample efficiency by constraining analyte atom to the light path for a longer period of time. Although some modifications have been brought about in AAS, so that trace quantities also can be analyzed. However, it is not as sensitive as ICP. Other techniques, the cold vapor mercury technique specifically, specifically meant for mercury analysis is the only metal which can exist as atom at room temperature. So, it can be measured without heating sample cell. This is a very special technique only meant for mercury. Another technique is hydride generation technique. Samples are reacted in an external system with a reducing agent, usually sodium borohydride. Gaseous reaction products are then carried to a sampling cell. The volatile hydrides are then heated in a sample cell. Now, here I would like to draw your attention that these, this hydride method is particularly used for arsenic and many other such transition metals, where they have a tendency of having variable oxidation state. In order to bring them to the same oxidation state and to convert them to the same hydride, it is then this hydride which is very volatile and analyzed. 
So, the total arsenic can be analyzed from this arsenic 3 and arsenic 5 are all converted into one oxidation states hydride and that hydride is analyzed. The third type of technique is graphite furnace. Instead of air acetylene furnace or instead of flame furnace, this is a furnace as the name suggests. It is not a flame, it is a furnace and the furnace is made out of graphite which gives even higher temperature for the sample to be uh, facing this higher temperature and getting volatilized. Most advanced and widely used and it is highly sensitive sampling technique. Trace metals in soil. How can trace metals be analyzed in soil? In soil, in salt affected soil, metal ions are accumulated in the form of soluble salts near the soil surface. Excessive concentration of metals can be associated with naturally occurring ore deposit, but more usually are the results of human activities. Leaching of metal is favored by high rainfall and where soils are coarse texture. Now, I would like to draw your attention that metals are not evenly dispersed in the soil. When there are soil which have salt, it will come to the soil surface. Sometimes excessive concentration of metals will occur because they have been in uh, like uh, deposits in definite pockets and this could be due to the dumping by the human activities or metals can be leached through rain water into the ground water because there is acid rain and due to the acidified action of the rain water the metals are uh, d uh, digested and leaching takes place and they enter the ground water. Trace metal poisoning. The cations of metals like arsenic, barium, lead and silver even if present in trace amounts have toxic effects. We all know that silver is a very good antimicrobial activity substance. The main source of arsenic are rodenticides, fungicides and insecticide. Barium are rodenticide and for lead poisoning are paints, leaching of glazed tiles, use of lead pipes and batteries. Silver poisoning are from photographic laboratory waste. You see, so these are the sources which cause the metal poisoning. For the arsenic, it can come from the, the poison that is created for rats or fungicides or insecticides. Barium again is a compound which is used for rat poisoning that is called rodenticide. And lead can come from paints, leaching of glaze tiles, use of lead pipes and so on. And silver poisoning can come from silver photographic laboratory waste because a lot of silver nitrate is being used there and untreatedly it is flown into the uh, waste water. Chromium poisoning. Time and again I am talking about chromium poisoning because it is a very, very crucial uh, poisoning and it has really caused a lot of devastation in the whole of tannery area. Chromium poisoning enters the environment through the natural as well as anthropogenic sources. The major anthropogenic sources of chromium include burning of oil and coal, pigments, oxidants, catalysts, refractory materials, chromium steel, tanneries and fertilizers. So, you see these are the major sources that mankind or anthropogenic causes uh, or sources have been uh, created by mankind and it has, we are responsible for it because we have not taken care of the waste and that has caused chromium poisoning. Chromium is also a component of coal, fly ash, urban dust and industrial effluent. You will be very surprised to know 
that the coal that is used in thermal power creates huge amount of fly ash and this fly ash is also a major source of chromium poisoning. With this we have come to an end of the main pollutants that are derived, but the story does not end there. Chromium still has a long long story and I need to dedicate some more time to chromium. What is chromium? Chromium is mined as chromite ore. Chromium compounds are widely used in industry and the valence state dramatically affects toxicity and chemical properties. Just yesterday I was telling you that chromium 3 is not toxic if it is within the limit. However, chromium 6 species is highly toxic even in trace quantities. So, what does it mean that the same metal can be in one oxidation state less toxic than the other oxidation state which is highly toxic. Why chromium and valence matter? Chromium metal is uh, at zero valency, bivalent chromium that is chromous chloride, chromous sulphate, trivalent the most prevalent form in the environment because of reducing condition chromium 4 and chromium 5 are found as transition products and the most notorious is the chromium 6. It is highly reactive and because of its high oxidation state it has a great reactivity also. So, these are the various oxidation states of chromium. Industries that contribute to chromium compound and its toxicity, anodizing agencies, color television, picture tube, manufacturing agency, copper itching, glass working, lithography, metal plating, metal working, oil purification, photo engraving, photography, Portland cement use, stainless steel grinding, textile production and wielding. You will see that these many industries apart from tanneries. How does the average person get exposed to? Primarily through food. About 90 percent of chromium which we get affected with is through food channel. Some exposure comes from drinking water. Air exposure is significant except near the industrial sources like chrome, chrome plating facilities, cooling towers, emissions from, from power plants and waste disposal. These are other localized areas which can cause airborne chromium species to get into our system. Occupations that may involve chromium exposure, exposure include metal plating operations. People who are working in these occupations are getting affected by chromium 6. Painters get affected by chromium 3 and chromium 6. Workers involved in the maintenance and servicing of copying machines and disposal of some toner powders from the copying machines are exposed to chromium 6. Battery makers are exposed to chromium 6 species. Candle makers are exposed to chromium 3 and chromium 6. Dye makers use chromium 6. Printers use chromium 3 and chromium 6. Rubber makers use chromium 3 and chromium 6 and so they are exposed to both the species. Cement workers are exposed to chromium 3 and 6. Industrial workers near cooling towers have been exposed to chromium 6. So, you see that there are variety of occupations where they are directly exposed to these levels. Let me tell you that chromium 3 under the oxidizing conditions and under the air conditions are easily converted to chrome 6. So, the chrome 3 which is less toxic can become more toxic under the moisturous condition and in under conditions where oxidation can be facilitated. Higher than normal levels of chromium can come from 
landfill sites with chromium containing waste. Sometimes lot of industrial dumps are put as landfills. Cement producing plants because cement contains chromium. Industrial cooling towers that previously used chromium as a rust inhibitors also can be a cause for high levels of chromium. Waterways that receive industrial discharges from electroplating, leather tanning and textile industries can also be a causative for chromium levels to be high. Busy roadways because emissions from automobiles, brake lining and catalytic converters contain chromium. So, all these can create higher and higher levels of chromium than the normal level of chromium that would normally exist in the air and water and soil. Now, chromium is a deadly carcinogen or necessary element is a debatable issue. It is both. Chromium 3 is necessary to maintain blood glucose level. However, chromium 6 is classified as a known carcinogen. So, you see that one of the species is our friend and the other species is our enemy. Ingestion. Gastric contents rapidly reduce chromium 6 to chromium 3. During this reduction process, severe erosion injury to the stomach can occur. Even small ingestions of dichromates have resulted in hemorrhage, gastroenteritis and even death. 13 accidental ingestions reported, 7 of them to be fatal. So, you see how it reacts in our biological system. When we ingest a chromium species by accident through food chain, what it does? It starts reacting in the body system. The chrome 6 then gets reduced to chrome 3 and during this reduction process, it causes injury in the stomach and hemorrhage takes place. And as many as 13 from 7 out of 13 are fatal that causes death. So, you see how dangerous it is. It is not only a known carcinogen, but it is also death causing by this kind of internal hemorrhage. What about effects on the skin? We also know that chromium 6 causes dermal allergy. It is an irritant and sensitizer. Chromium 6 compound cause skin ulcers or chrome holes commonly seen in nasal septum. Not only in the nasal septum, but also on the skin when chrome 6 affects or it reacts, it starts forming some kind of ulcers or blisters and so on. May be a culprit in housewife eczema. It can also be that if the housewives are using, it can cause eczema or dermal uh, ulcers. Once sensitized, mostly they say sensitized and chromium 6 salts are quickly absorbed. So, that is even worse that as compared to the reactivity, solubility and the absorption, chrome 6 has all the notorious properties. How does it affect the lung? It can induce asthma. Chrome 6 is known to cause lung cancer. There have been several medical studies and it has been proven time and again that chrome 6 is responsible for lung cancer. Chromate compounds that are insoluble are more potent. Zinc chromate is the most potent chromate found in industrial setting, particularly in the paints which are used for aircraft. So, chromates are the source through which you know it is inhaled and when it reaches the lung, it gets set into the lung and there it causes the cancerous activity or acts as a carcinogen. Poisoning, ingestion, no emesis if ingested may be corrosive if chromium 6 is, uh, uh, is not present. Absorb Ascorbic acid administered orally, if chromium still in, is in stomach, can help. Digestion or dilution with milk or water can also help. 
gastric lavage, removal of chromium 6 weighed against perforation can also happen. Chelation therapy may not be a very effective in this case. So, once the poisoning has taken place, how can one help by taking certain compounds to be able to uh, reduce the effect of chrome 6? Poisoning in dermal, irritate, uh, irrigate with water, look for chrome 6 burn damage and treat appropriately. Tropical application of 10 percent ascorbic acid or of a barrier cream containing 2 percent of glycine and 1 percent of tartaric acid has proved beneficial. So, if there is a dermal uh, uh, poisoning caused by chromium, one can use a combination of glycine and tartaric acid or uh, simply ascorbic acid and 10 percent of ascorbic acid if it is applied on the skin can help it. When it is a cause that is caused by inhalation, it sh the air should be made clear. If respiratory distress is taking place, oxygen should be provided. Observe carefully the signs of pulmonary edema. Drinking water limits. Now, since it is such a crucial and critical and toxic uh, substance, EPA has that is the Environmental Protection Agency has set up a maximum level of chromium of uh, chrome 3 and chrome 6 in drinking water as 100 microgram chromium per liter. According to EPA, the following levels of chromium 3 and chromium 6 in drinking water are not expected to cause effects that are harmful to health. For children, particularly if it is 1400 microgram per liter for 10 days and if they are exposed, it does not cause any bad effect. For children, if it is 240 microgram per liter for even longer term exposure, it does not cause any harm. For adults, it is 840 microgram per liter for longer term exposure and it was found that it did not cause any ill effect. Similarly, 120 microgram chromium per liter for lifetime exposure for adults is also safe. EPA for soil cleanup goals. The US EPA region 9 soil residential pre pre sorry. US EPA region 9 soil residential pre preliminary re remediation goal showed that chrome 3 at 100,000 milligram per kilogram chrome 6 chrome 3 at 210 milligram per kilogram and chrome 6 alone only 30 milligram per kilogram can be allowed. Chrome 3 is the predominant form in soil, but a 1 is to 6 chrome 6 is to 3 ratio is sometimes used for soil cleanup. OSHA limits, the occupational exposure limits for an 8 hour work day for 40 hour work week are 500 microgram chromium per cubic meter for water soluble chromic salts, 1000 microgram chromium per cubic meter for metallic chromium and the levels for chromium trioxide that is the chromic acid and other chromium 6 compounds in the workplace should not be higher than 52 microgram chromium for chrome 6 for any period of time. OSHA is proposing lowering of chrome 6 standard to 1 microgram per uh, meter cube. Biological monitoring is therefore very essential. 